Hello, everybody. Um, I guess we're in week five, question and answer. I've got Tomer Gueta and Mona Papage with me. Um, and we're going to jump into some questions. Sara Mortara in Brazil, who did one of the two presentations for this week, uh, is sorry, but she's unable to make it um, to this session. Um, she said that that the uh, the rains this week have been rather strong, and so she doesn't have good internet access. Um, but she also said that she would uh, do her best to post at least some of the answers to some of the questions um, by by Monday. So I'll put those on the course page uh, if and when she provides them to me. Let's go ahead and jump into your question. So I'm going to share the screen. And let's see. Here we go. There are your questions. But first, let's look at the course page. So here we are in the in key tools. This week, we have um, a presentation from me about the basic toolkit for niche modeling and the presentation from Sara about uh, one set of tools for data cleaning. Um, next week, as of Monday, I'll be putting two toolbox um, uh, videos online, one about niche toolbox and one about SDM toolbox. I think you'll like those quite a bit. And then after that, we're going to start into environmental data, then occurrence data, and then a lot of stuff about, about how we estimate niches and, and distributions. So we're, we're in the thick of it now. We're, we're into the, the meat of the course. Um, so stick with it and be sure you get your questions in. One thing I'll, I'll point out about the course per se is that I've indicated to several of the students that I'm not going to be strict right now about questions being submitted each week. Uh, I think it ends up being a little bit onerous for the students. Um, but I think we will later in the course, for those of you who are wanting a certificate of participation, uh, we will do some exercises that are explicitly homework. And so we'll give you a bit of warning on those when those are coming up. And you will be expected to turn those in. But we'll, again, we'll give warning about that. Okay, let's go into the questions. And Mona and Tomer, you guys feel completely free to tell me you know, go to line such and such, there's a question I want to answer or the question I want to discuss. And as you can see, I've gone through the questions from this week and I've signaled in yellow some that I'd like to look at, but you guys just jump in and, and say, hey, you know, go to such and such a line and I'll go there, okay? Sure. So, well, the yeah, go ahead, Mona. I was going to say the first two questions you highlighted in yellow, I guess they're good to start with. <laughs> okay, jump on them. <laughs> okay, so um, I think they are, uh, um, they are at the opposite ends, right? The second question on line 927 says, is it absolutely necessary to use GIS programs such, such as ArcGIS? And the other one says, do, I, do we need to learn R or Python now or in the future in order to succeed? So um, I would say that for large, for large uh, multi-species projects, uh, R is probably the, most, uh, the better way to approach uh, these, these large projects. Uh, on the other hand, um, we want to make our models reproducible as much as possible. And so R has been proposed as uh, the way to, to make our, our work transparent and reproducible. Um, so 
but in the end it's whatever you are capable of using uh, very well, um, I guess, uh, there's, uh, there's, there seems to be a little bit of, you know, depending the camp, a little bit of fight between R and Python, uh, ArcGIS, QuantumGIS, or um, so on and so forth. But it depends on what you have access to, I, I think, and what you, you are, good at and learning fast. I don't know. Go over <clears throat> your thoughts. I agree. I'm saying R is probably the default. Uh, I'm a bit biased, but uh, looking at the big picture, it will give you the, the most uh, value for effort right now. Uh, and really what is most powerful in R is that it's a, a programming language that is it's designed for non-programmers. So it's, today it's much easier to learn R. There is R Studio. They have tons of packages and, 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 and stuff to learn R quite quickly. Uh, but so I would go with R rather than Python, although also Python is excellent by itself. It's a much more broader programming language. And regarding GIS, I think it's, a, it's good to have another, like a backup because Go to QGIS, it's open source, it's free, and it's quite fast also. And sometimes some things are quite difficult in R to do in some special analysis. So it's worth having this as a backup. Um, and again, with tools, it's always use the right tool for the right uh, purpose. Like so you need to have like a toolkit, like a weapon that you use the right weapon for the, for the right uh, task. So R is number one, and if you have more time, and I would invest in some Q, QGIS, is good enough. It's, so just go with it. So I, I'll come at that question from a different perspective, but probably get to the same or much the same answer. Um, I'm an example of a person who is working in this field and does not have ability in R. The only secret weapon that I have is that I have smart students <laughs> who are conversant in R. Um, but what I can say is that it is definitely impeding my ability to be a functioning scientist in this field not having R. Um, I have a programming language that I learned before most of you were born, which was basic, which I learned in 1976. Um, learned it okay, but it's, it's pretty cumbersome compared to modern languages. Um, but the thing with R is that so many tools are being published with papers now that I'm, I personally feel almost non-functional. Uh, I've I'm already... Uh, I was gonna say, I'm also non-functional in R, uh, <laughs> so yes, it's a big, it's a big, um, um, I don't know, hump that I need to go over. <laughs> Mona, I think you are less non-functional than I am. I've, it's <laughs> you actually do things in R. So. Anyhow, the the second question is an interesting one. Is it absolutely necessary to use a GIS program? And I think that's where it's worth making some more detailed comments. R has a whole bunch of functionalities, um, but it's not necessarily part of the processing in R to see the result every, at, of every step that you perform. And that can be quite of concern. Now, if you're good in R, and I'm, I'm surrounded by some really good people here, they build in plotting essentially in real time to everything they do. And so with every step, every time they hit return and some, some line of code runs, they see what it does to their map. 
And that's something that you get in a GIS program. And so that has a really, really important function, which is that when you screw up or when the program doesn't do exactly what you thought it was going to do, you see it. And you don't proceed five steps further and either then have to backtrack lots of steps or maybe you don't see the problem. I'll give you an example. I was working with a data set for plants in a country in West Africa. And so there was a, it, it was an inherited data set, not my colleague's data, but rather a data set that he'd been, he'd been passed. And when, when I got around to pulling up the data in a GIS, it just looked like it had a little bit of rhythm to it in terms of data density. You'd see kind of every hundred kilometers, a lot of records, a few records, a lot of records, a few records. And, you know, the extent was pretty much right on to the country. But it was just somehow weird. It looked, I mean, the, the, the adjective would be ribbed. It looked like it had, you know, kind of a wave to it. And it was one of these things where I didn't understand it because I'd never seen that before. But eventually, I just kept thinking about it and kept thinking about it. And I realized that what had happened was there had been a, a field delimiter of a point. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, that point was used to separate whole degrees from decimal degrees. And in other cases, it was used to separate whole degrees from minutes. And so the minutes never got above 60. And so what I had interpreted as decimal parts of degrees went from 0 0.0 up to 0 0.6, but never got to 0 0.61 or to 0 0.8. And so that created higher data densities in 6 tenths of the degree and lower densities in the remaining 4 tenths of the degree. I never would have seen that if I'd gone a few steps farther and hadn't been really profoundly bothered by that, that ribbing. So I'm not saying not to use R. What I'm saying is to use R and to take the time to visualize every step. And it's cumbersome and you know it's extra lines of code and sometimes it'll take a long time to plot and yet it's really crucial and then about python i really see python as more of a complement where some of the more advanced analyses that you're going to do will require programming and you know maybe it's simulations or something like that so i don't see you know, if you have R, I don't necessarily see Python as absolutely crucial, but I think it's something that it's going to serve you well as you go on to higher level and higher level applications. Dan, your your um, example of how how um, automated processing can can fail us um, is really good and. Because it, it happened to us um, last summer, we we were downloading. We had students working on a project, and we were I don't know. We had seventeen or eighteen species, and the students were very they have, have a math background and very eager to learn how to uh, do everything in R. So the whole uh, niche modeling uh, process, and I was you know checking GB for data the the very uh, archaic way of going to their website and downloading a, spread, a, you know, a CSV file. And then when we met with the students, we had different numbers of occurrences. For a certain, I didn't download all, but for some species, we're like, oh, interesting. I found this many, why did you find this many? And it took them about half a day or so 
to figure out that there was an issue with some coordinates and I, I we they didn't figure out what what the issue was but the package they were using was was cleaning data um, was had some sort of a filter that that was not working well with parts of the data that were available on GB. So it could have been a, a delimiter, like you said, that turned um, basically records that had, had uh, coordinates, turned them into zero, no coordinates. Mm -hmm. So it's good to, I guess the <laughs> moral of the story is always check, you know, whenever we use a piece of software, but we always, try to to double check what we are doing so don't don't trust fully <laughs> one tool uh try to to double check what you're doing uh, if possible with another tool and I, I guess a more also general point i wanted to make was that for someone who's starting in the field and has no r no python no uh, maybe a little bit of QGIS and not much more. Don't feel like you have to start with everything, you know, learn everything at the same time. And you, you can be functionally in ENM if you don't have any, um, I see the next line um, was the line uh, 9928. Uh, so someone is, is asking, you know, I'm R challenged, what am I doing? You can, you can slowly learn, but in the meantime, you can also use, you know, the, if you're using Maxent, you can use the uh, Java interface, the, you know, GUI interface. So if, if, you, if you're just starting to use ENM and you don't have any skills, <laughs> don't feel like, oh, this is too much to get into the field. There's, there are ways. You don't have to jump straight into, you know, R or even worse, Python, <laughs> programming your way through multi-species modeling and whatnot. That's all. And in, in fact, regarding that line 928 question, which is, does the team have any recommendations for tutorials that are reasonably accessible? Um, I'll get some together. I'll consult with the whole instructor team. I'll get some together and put them online for, for everybody because that's a, that's a very good point. And, and Shao, remember for our, um, our workshop at Nimbustown, Shao put together a really nice how to in R, how to download the current data, how to process environmental data and run models. So I can send you that link if you want. Please do, I'll, I'll remind you. I have okay. also some, some cool resources, but on that point, I'm, I'm saying that for new students, you should invest some, some energy in looking for the right resource because there is such diversity and, and you really should invest more of picking the right resource that suit your way of learning uh, and Google and go deep into Google. There are lots of things hidden there. And also in Twitter, there is tons of, of communication about the learning R and what's going on there. So it's a really valuable resource these days. Yeah. I, I like this one on 933. Why can't there be an ENM platform integrated <laughs> to rule them all? It was clear from the short lecture that there isn't one, and all of the attempts to achieve it have failed. But why? I understand that the particularities of each approach, species, and study area call for methodological adaptations, but couldn't there be a general friendly platform or a guiding R script that encompasses all the steps? So I guess I'm kind of a veteran of being the, you know, the dumb use case for lots of these projects. And I've kind of seen two endpoints. One endpoint is the completely generic platform. And so I was part of an early effort, which I mentioned in my talk, that was based on the Kepler platform. And there were some absolutely amazing programmers involved in that project. And they, they put an unbelievable amount of work into that project and it was never used, ever. And that was something that was so generic that it really was too much, too much um, prior knowledge required 
and it wasn't any known platform. So, you know, even a, an accomplished programmer like, like Tomer would have to have gone back and learned a new language. And so that was, that was the reason that one didn't manage to be able to rule them all. Um, and then the other end point is where you try to package the workflow, the, 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 the exact workflow. And that was part of another project where there was a, the desire to capture the University of Kansas workflow. And this project sent a team of, I believe it was three very smart uh, computer scientists to come to KU and capture our workflow. And I thought a lot about that, that visit. And I realized, no, there is no workflow. There are tools, there are modular tools that we use repeatedly. But even those, we use them differently every time. So I think if you want a platform that can rule them all, well, learn R. Right? That is generic enough and flexible enough that if you learn it deeply, it, it can do essentially everything and more and more will do everything as you know people like me recede into the background or depend on our conversant people but i'm really i'm really quite convinced that that this is not one workflow and so that means that any attempt to create something that is not modular and customizable, any of it, any in, uh, attempt like that will fail. That's maybe a pessimistic view. Now, next week, you're going to see Niche Toolbox and SDM Toolbox, and they are exactly what their names say. They're toolboxes. <laughs> and I find myself with both of those programs, I'll jump in, grab one thing that I need and then jump out. And so I'm not using them as this workflow that does everything. I'm using them as a toolbox. So my personal viewpoint and Tomer and Mona can agree or disagree or have a different viewpoint, but my personal viewpoint is you need to have a conceptual framework. And you need to think about how that conceptual framework applies to each project that you get involved with. And from that interaction between conceptual framework and a particular project, that'll generate your custom workflow. And then you need to prowl around you know, those toolboxes and plant R and all the other tools that you'll see in this course and all the other tools that are out there or that will be out there. And you need to find the right set of tools that respond to your particular project. And if you try to fo follow any single workflow that somebody else developed, you're gonna make dumb mistakes. Guys, what do you think? Well, I go ahead, Tomas. I agree, but I'm less uh, pessimistic, um, mainly because I'm seeing today the trends and coming from now I'm more and more software, I call myself more like a software engineer than an ecologist, basically. Uh, <laughs> this is the situation right now. Don't go, Tomer, we want you in ecology. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it, I have to understand all the perspectives and, and understanding how to develop the tools from the ground up is immensely critical for, for understanding what kind of infra scientific infrastructure is missing. So, but what, what is actually asking is if there is, what is the holy grail of, of scientific uh, software, which is uh, something that is um, sustainable, that is agile and is reproducible. So if you can have that, this framework uh, implemented in your, uh, in your system, then you have a good start. And this is something actually 
we're trying to achieve and it's very ambition but ambitious but we are working towards doing something like that for data cleaning we thinking what kind of infrastructure is desperately needed from standardization to data check factory to workflows that are user friendly for cleaning from dashboard but we're starting from from the ground up uh, and I think we have like we have really cool stuff going on uh, it's very demanding but it's we will get there and I think I see like in Wallace and in other uh, 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 initiative similar to that, that this modularity, and especially if you are in R, because in R you have such a high synergetic value that you can connect so many packages, they're doing so much stuff, this is like the right place to be in that sense. So we are there, and, and additionally we have the virtual environments that are starting to pop up, like the Echo Cloud, like the Australian Echo Cloud or the Galaxy, which are really Im Im ambitious uh, projects that will help us to have these tools much easier uh, accessible by deployment or scalability that we can uh, put our tools there and integrate them. So the future, I think we, in, in, in the technical aspect, I think we, we will get there. It's a journey, it's a, but I'm in a sense more worried about fitness for use. Like the, the, the level of understanding this will be relevant no matter how great the tools are. And this kind of concept or, or uh, how to get clarity about the fitness of use of your data, uh, this is the big, this scares, this scares me the most in that sense. Okay, we'll come to that in the next question, I think. <laughs> Mona, are you an optimist or a pessimist? Uh, I'm an optimist. <laughs> But maybe not when it comes to <laughs> to these uh, platforms that rule them all. But anyways. <laughs> uh, that's what I was asking about. I mean, you oh, could be an um, optimist or a pessimist about the elections in November. Ooh, <laughs> I'm optimistic about those as well. I'm starting to realize that I think I'm an optimist, but I'm, I'm more of a pessimist. <laughs> um, but uh, no, so the, I think, I think it's good to have, uh, we had open modeler, I think open modeler still exists. We had many years ago open modeler that was the first uh, I, that I was aware of, first platform that tried to uh, integrate multiple uh, uh, modeling algorithms. Um, so it, I, I would say that the limitation, um, well, like Tomer said, the limitation is in what you need to do. And, and Tom, you said the same thing. You know, so, some platforms or so, someone's workflow may not work for you. And then if we try to generalize that workflow that works for everybody, uh, it becomes uh, Kepler, I guess. Um, so I, and I don't know why we would need a platform. First of all, why do we need something that rules them all? <laughs> uh, and second, that platform would have to keep changing because new methods keep, uh, keep getting developed. So it's a very dynamic field. And then so that, that, uh, one ring to rule them all will have to be uh, modified at all times. So, um, yeah, if you if you want workflows, I guess R is your <laughs> ring to rule them all. There's probably a middle ground where you could build very smart and agile tools on a platform like R that maybe do not rule them all, but at least permit them all. Anyhow, let's go on to the next question, which Tomer already kind of alluded to. Shouldn't the data be revised or reviewed by the platform when they're inputted into GBIF? Isn't there a process of blind reviewers to ensure the quality of the data available on the database websites? And since there isn't one, shouldn't the person who reviews the data for their own work correct the inputs of the online database so that it would be cleaner for the next users? So there's a huge amount to unpack here. First of all, data are not input into GBIF or any of the other data portals. Those are data portals. 
the data flow from whatever the owner or originator institution through the portal to the user. And GBIF or any other data portal would be insane ever to think about taking responsibility for the data quality. Second thing is data quality is all relative. I may be interested in occurrences of species of, I don't know, whatever, you know, mosquitoes at the level of country. And another person may want georeferenced data that are precise to 100 meters. And very easily, a data point can be orders of magnitude, miserably bad and totally useless for that other person, but could be golden for me. Which is to say, Tomer hit it very subtly, but he said fitness for use. So I come to a particular project or analysis with some use that I'm planning. It might be a niche model that's precise to 100 meters. It might be a niche model that's precise to 10,000 meters. Or it might be some simpler use of the data. But that use defines my quality requirements. And so there's no single stamp of quality that could ever be put on a data set. Now, a data set could be reviewed under standard protocols. For example, do the geographic coordinates in that data record fall inside that country that is listed in the data record? That's a very simple test. It's essentially a test for internal consistency in the data record. And that test can be done and a particular check of quality could be indicated with that data record. But fitness for use is the really important thing. Is the record of sufficient quality to meet the needs of a particular analysis? What do you guys think? I totally agree. I'm, I'm, in that case, I'm always uh, reminding students that Darwin Core is a, is a format that is very in inclusive. It's designed in a way to support a very heterogeneous data, from species checklist, from uh, locations list, from data that comes from the collection. So it's by purpose designed to have minimal uh, quality control. So this is the, the trade-off of this type of of, of uh, standard. However, uh, I know that Tedwick uh, Data Quality Task Force is working several years now for developing uh, like the core quality tests that, that it's, they're almost ready and I think they're now uh, trying to implement them. And ideally they will be implemented in every, in, in each data, part of data aggregator. They will have this quality checks that will be a, a standard across all publishers. Uh, it will take some time, maybe a few years for everyone to implement them because it's, a, it's a, not that trivial, but we will get there. Uh, but again, as you said, we can have them as, as but they won't be, they won't be like a, one perfect recipe that will make sure that it's, it's the perfect, the ultimate data cleaning uh, workflow. There isn't one, there shouldn't be one. But we can start thinking of what are like, like the most basic uh, cleaning procedures that should be presented in a very clear and, and, and usable and user-friendly way. So um, there, there is a lot of gray in there. So um, I'm thinking the future will be brighter, but it will take time to get there. But the key aspect of any research is 
it's understanding the needs. And those needs, as, as Tom previously uh, said in one of his, uh, one of the SDM reports, I think that you made for GBIS, you have to know your species or taxonomic group, you have to know your data and you have to know your analysis. Only then you, you can derive what is exactly your needs. And this is something that is always be true and always be a skill uh, that you have to, 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 to do. So, yeah. Yeah, I would just reiterate what, what you and, and Town said. So I have nothing uh, to add to this. Okay, any questions that either of you want me to jump to? Mm. Well, we can go to the ones you highlighted. Well, the one that I highlighted in red, I've warned the participants about before. This is the, the question that gets asked the most in the <laughs> courses, and it is a, a prohibited question. What is the minimum number of occurrence points to model a species distribution? Is there any rule? Answer, no. <laughs> Let's go on to the next question. <laughs> I mean, very seriously, people, there is no answer. It depends on the species and the landscape and the environmental dimensions. So no, there is no good answer to that. I've published several papers asking that question and probably should just erase them from my CV because they were, they were really ill-conceived papers. Anyhow, having <laughs> high density of points in a reduced area should be problematic for building a model. Can we use any of the packages from the data cleaning talk to reduce this density? Can, can I make a comment on the first part? High density of points in a reduced area. One yeah. thing to consider is you can have a reduced area, but if it, if it has the pixel size of, I don't know, 10 meters, um, the density of points should be relative to your sampling of the environment. You might have high sampling of the environment uh, with fine uh, resolution data in a small area, and then high density of points is actually good. But anyways, so aside from that, considering one kilo kilometer resolution, the, the default kilometer resolution and a reduced area, then you can reduce, I guess, a few hundred pixels, then you can talk about high density of points. I think there's a, there's a more general point, which is you have to think about what produces that high density of points. Let's imagine some ideal situation where we have a, a tag on the back of every single organism that makes up that species. And so we're completely objectively detecting species with no spatial bias, we're detecting the individuals of our species. In that case, a high density of points in a reduced area may be very meaningful biological information. Which is to say when, when high and low density areas in our data set have biological meaning, then we really may want to include those high and low densities in our analysis. Very often, however, high density might refer to, you know, near a field station where there are lots of biologists or near a city where there are lots of citizen scientists or, um, in a place that is known as a uh, topotypic locality where lots of sampling gets done. Those are things that don't have biological meaning. And so in that case, yeah, it would be problematic because you're essentially including too many votes for a particular area for reasons that have nothing to do with the population biology of the species. So I think 
you have to, as I always say, you have to think about your concepts and you have to think about the species you're studying and the sampling that led to the data you're using. And you have to think about why does that high density exist rather than just busting down the high density to low density. Yeah, I, I always say that if only all species had a smartphone, <laughs> it was much nicer. But I would categorize it as a, as a sampling bias problem. Uh, and there are a few packages to thinning the data based on geographical uh, space or, or, or environmental one. Uh, I think one, several of them are implemented in Wallace. Uh, so today there are more ways of easily doing it. But as you said, you really need to understand what is the source of the bias and, and what is, which assumption is it uh, violates. Here's a question from Anais Vignoles. Uh, she's an uh, archaeologist. Um, and she asks, I'm especially interested in the question of how to quantify uncertainty of identification of a species. She says, I, I actually work with archaeological cultures, but I guess you might have the same kind of problems in biodiversity studies. Yes, we do. Um, <laughs> how can we classify sources of data according to their reliability in a quantitative and reproducible way? Wonderful question. Yeah, great um, question. Certainly, if we are not stressed about sample size, then the expert, like you, Anais, and like the taxonomic specialist in a biodiversity study, the expert is the, the, the gold standard, which is to say, you could imagine reducing your data set to only those points where the expert has said, yes, I've checked it individually and I'm sure. Or where, you know, the, the molecular geneticist has obtained a molecular barcode and has said, yeah, I sequenced it and it is that species. Okay, one, one useful thing to do is to develop different levels of certainty and develop separate analyses for you know, only the highest level of certainty, which may be limited or constrained or even compromised by small data uh, numbers. And then relaxing our data uh, quality classification and saying, well, if I go to you know, not just level one, but levels one and two, now I have more points. What does my model look like? And then you could relax it still more. I'm going to go out to level four and say, you know, not just level one or level one and two, but all the way down to this level. And you can. And so you're essentially saying, I'm going to accept more uncertainty, but I'm also going to benefit from more data points. And you can see how your models respond to that balance of numbers of data points versus increasing data quality. Now, one thing we're going to talk about later in this course, and I'll, I'll mention the precise quantity, which is uh, a quantity we call capital E. Uh, Mona was a co-author on this paper back in the late Pleistocene with <laughs> me and Muir Eaton. But essentially, we, we realized that there's always going to be some uncertainty in your data. But some data sets will have more uncertainty and some data sets will have less uncertainty. And so we created this, this parameter E, which was kind of a subjective uh, evaluation of how clean or how dirty you think your data set is likely to be. And you're going to see later in this course that we can use that evaluation quantitatively when we do model evaluations, when we do model calibration, 
when we decide on a threshold for converting a model to binary. And it's, it's just a way of explicitly acknowledging that, that data sets aren't perfect and that some data sets are less perfect than other data sets. And that if you take that into account explicitly, you can at least be more honest with yourself that, that there's some noise or some dirt in your, in your data. <coughs> Any thoughts, guys? Yeah, actually, this is an issue I'm thinking about it a lot. I call it the good, the bad, and the unclear. What you do with the uncertainty and all the, those, uh, and how to quantify them inside your analysis. And as you said, this is like the most practical approach. Just do kind of a sensitivity analysis on different scenarios of that quality or different types of cleaning uh, and see what happens to your signal. See what is happening there. But there is a big caveat in that kind of approach that you have to accommodate for different uh, thinning of the data or other biases that might be involved. For example, if you are doing like a very strict data cleaning that you are only like the impartial uh, characteristics of the data that you are basically can operate on like 15% of the data, which is mostly the, the, usual, the usual case that you don't have that on all of the all of your records. So you actually, if you're doing very severe data cleaning, you might operate on very sub, on a sub a specific subset of your data. So you might even ent enter in like a bias inside. So you need to do it very carefully and, and focus uh, on not all of the aspect of the cleaning, but like what are the most sensitive one, what what scares you the most. But the blessing in disguise that I I I see in this approach is that know in advance that you have to run your entire analysis from start, start to finish, like everything, several times in order to evaluate the, 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 the usage of, of data quality, that's actually kind of force you to re be really reproducible. So this is the half full glass that I'm saying, like if you, if you do that, you will earn, you will, you will, you will, your future self will say thank you, uh, your peers will say thank you and uh, your, reviewers and, and so in a sense everything is about reproducibility and this is something that I will invest a lot in my talk of, of how to get this kind of what are the values of reproducibility and what are the latest tricks to, to gain it in a sense. That's a great point Tomer. Thanks. I'm gonna I'm gonna think about that a bit. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah I don't I don't have anything uh, <laughs> else to add, but I agree with your, your points of view. Okay. Um, I'm afraid I have a class that I have to teach at 10. So I'm gonna, I think that's probably our last question. Um, okay. Mona, Tomer, any, any general reflections to pass on to the students? Any thoughts? I think the, the reoccurring thing is how to start doing it. So I think resource, like gathering the resource from all the instructors can be a really beneficial act. And one thing that we might need to explore is how to make sure that everything that we put in this, all the examples are extremely reproducible, like as a general uh, standard in this course. One, one thing that we might, it's worth put, doing is, is using the RStudio Cloud which is free and you can do like a project with everything already installed there and everyone can just uh, like you can have it through your browser the environment with everything already set up um, so thinking about um, like we need to lead by example in a sense so it's something that we need to figure out and maybe then uh, students will pick up the, those techniques hmm. Um, Tomer, feel very, very free to uh, bring that up on the instructor mail list and I will. see if we can generate some activity along those lines. I'm obviously not the person to, to make that happen, but um, I'd love to see that happen. So feel free yeah. to use that mailing list. I will. Well, and I, I will say just for those, the, the students who are 
just starting, have, you know, just starting to um, explore the niche modeling world. Um, like Tome, <laughs> I would say, invest the time, invest the time to learn how to do the work properly and yeah, go from there. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you guys immensely for, for joining in. And again, I'm going to run off and teach. So sure. I'm afraid I've got to go, but thanks a lot. And we'll see you soon. Thank okay, you, Tom. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.